I'm Mary Ann Dyson. Um, a, a lot of you already know me, but um, for those who don't, I'll introduce myself. Um, I, oh, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Um, I'm a children's author, and I'm, I'm also on the uh, National Space Society Board of Directors, and um, came up through the ranks, joined L5 back in 1977. And I used to work for NASA as a flight controller uh, for the early shuttle program. And then I transitioned over into being a writer on something that paid less than work with the government. <laughs> anyway, um, th this is my book, Space Station Science. It won the Golden Kite Award for Best Nonfiction Children's Book of 1999. I've been doing a lot of visits in schools um, and with teacher groups. and. Um, I'm going to show you some of the experiments that I do with the kids um, today, and if you would like me to come to your uh, ch child's school, or your nephew or niece's school, or your neighborhood school, whatever, um, I have a forum about my author visits, and uh, I'll be happy to give you a copy of that. And I have a web page for those of you who are just want to check me out a little bit. It's, um, it's on this yellow forms that I had out there, but if it's, some of you want to write it down. It's www.geocities dot com slash Marianne Dyson. And you can find me if you go on Yahoo and search under authors, children, and you should find me. Okay. I started out getting interested in space by reading. Um, when I was in the fifth grade, I read Starman Jones by Robert Heinlein. I'm sure many of you have read this book. Um, this copy that I, got, I read it from the library. And then I went and got my own copy, which was uh, 60 cents when I got it. And it but you can still buy it on um, BarnesandNoble.com for $6.39. So I, I always try to let the kids know that there's books out there. Okay. First, page. First thing I'd like to talk to you about in a general audience, I've discovered that um, not only it's not just the children that don't understand what space is, but a lot of the, the adults just never really thought about it and what is space. And um, so the first thing I talk about is that space is different from Earth. And we all know there's no air up there. And usually we think there's no gravity, but of course there is gravity. What we have is free fall. So I explained to the kids what free fall means. And this makes a lot of things clear to them once they understand why um, we're weightless. And so I start out with you build the tower 200 miles high and you stand out on your bathroom scale and you weigh 90% of what you weigh on the ground. And that's because there's still gravity in space, and, but of course it's a little bit less as you get farther away from the source. And if you step off that tower, gravity will pull you down to the bottom, of course you really burn up in the atmosphere. This is not to scale, but um, the kids get the basic idea that gravity is still in force and still pulling them to the ground. And then it's, you know, if you stand, uh, take a running leap, like you're going off a diving board at a swimming pool, instead of falling at the end of the board, you, you go in an arc and you fall outward. And they also um, know about that from throwing balls. They know that they go in an arc and then they come back down. And so if you could run fast enough to jump off that board or you could throw that ball fast enough, you could throw it and it would go, keep on going and go right over the horizon and it would keep falling without hitting the ground. And that's what we call free fall. See, it's free because there's no payback when you hit the ground. And, and I said, but if you were, um, if there wasn't any gravity and you, and you went jumping that fast, 18,000 miles an hour fast, you would just keep going in a straight line on out. But gravity causes you to curve around and go into an orbit around the Earth. Of course, you can go even faster and escape. But um, this is just the, this is a picture from my book to kind of illustrate what free fall means. All right, and I have some experiments which I use to reinforce this. So one of the things I do is I, I take a you know a little postal scale. And I show that when you put a weight on it, it goes down. I have a stapler. A stapler is the only thing I have for that's heavy. Well, I don't. I'm going to hold it up. I just can't. I, it's hard without a clip-on mic. But um, and they see that it pushes it down. You can see that red thing there. Um, and when when I drop the scale, it will pop the red. Um, bar will go back up to the top, so that it's weightless while it's falling. All the things, right? And that's how I weightless in free fall. And I tell them they can um, 
You can also do this with your kids at home with your bathroom scale. Uh, take a five pound bag of rice, sit it on there, you see it go to five, hold it out over the bed and drop it and you can see it go to zero while it's falling. But it takes a lot of energy to get going really fast. And um, I usually talk a little bit about the space shuttle, but I don't think we have that much time. Y'all are probably going to get hungry. So um, I, I talk about you know how the engines work and how it gets them going fast and so on. But we'll just skip that today. And say, but once you get into space, it takes about eight minutes um, to get to get up there and get into free fall. Then you can start taking advantage of, of the properties of free fall. And one of the experiments that's in my book that you can also do at home with kids is and for yourself, and you can just say you're practicing for someone doing it for some kids. Uh, take some uh, food coloring, which is basically made out of water, and you fill a little jar with oil, and you drop the food coloring in there, and you, while it's falling, you notice that it's a perfect sphere. Then when it gets to the bottom, it starts flattening out because gravity is squishing it, and so you can see that it's a perfect sphere while it's falling. And uh, there's a variation on this experiment that's not in the book, which I'll show you. And this is the one that I, I do in my demos. And I'm going to go ahead. This is the, there's the four steps. You take uh, a jar, and I have a test tube up here so it's easier to see. Um, you just put water in it, put a little bit of oil on the top. And it's not that critical how much oil, just enough, you know, usually to cover the top. And then take the food coloring and put it on there. And of course, the, um, the drop of food coloring will, will drop slowly through the oil. And then eventually it's going to break through. And then you can see gravity pulling, pulling it down, and they can actually watch it fall, and, and it starts mixing, of course, with the, um, with the water. And I call this the gravity bomb. And they like to do it in different colors. And, they, and one of the things you can make them time differently, uh, if you put in one drop, it, it happens very slowly. If you put in two or three drops, and they all go in together, then it's, you know, it happens more, fat, more quickly. So they can set up a whole um, series of these little things.
and so you feel the force of twice gravity going up, and then it drops 10,000 feet, and you have free fall for 25 to 30 seconds. And it does this 40 times, and there are a few people who don't get sick, such as Kelly. Um, but I'm actually in this picture, and she's blocking me, which is a good thing because I had my face in a bag. But um, <laughs> at any rate, uh, some people uh, do get motion sick when they, when they fly on these things. And some animals do too. Oh, let's turn it, turn it around. Uh, yeah. Up on the, uh, the upper left were some fish that were swimming peacefully back and forth in their fish tank. And then they took them up on one of these spikes. It was a Japanese version of the, uh, of the vomit comet. And you see what happened to the fish in the second one there. They started going every which way. Which way's up, which way's down. They're bouncing off the sides of the aquarium. And that's the space ver or fish version of space sickness. And um, what they were trying to find was fish that could adapt better to space, because they wanted to breed them in space. And they found that there were a couple of fish that, just after a second or two, started swimming back and forth normally. And they thought, well, how could, what's different about those fish? Why, why did they get space sick where the other ones did, didn't? You know, they were bouncing around. And, and the hypothesis was that it had something to do with their eyesight, and that uh, they were using light to orient themselves. So then they sent the fish up there with the light out, and all of them bounced off the inside, you know. And they said, okay, it does have something to do with the light, but um, why, why were some of the fish not doing it? And it was because of their eyesight. And they did some experiments to check fish eyesight, which were pretty fascinating. If you want to know more about how you do uh, the eyesight chart for, for a fish, I'll be happy to explain that to you. But, um, <laughs> it's really quite interesting, but we don't have time to go over all of it. Anyway, they picked, um, one of the experiments in my book um, is to check for your fish. Um, one of the things is whether or not the fish leans to the light. And it's a natural instinct for fish to keep their top fin to the light you know, that they would see at the top of the, the pond or the stream that they're in. And, um, and so if you go at home, if you have a fish bowl in the dark in your bedroom, you turn the lights out and put the flashlight on the top, you know, and the fish will be swimming with their top fins towards that light. And then you put the light over to the side, and the fish go, well, oh, like this. And it's really neat. I did it with my fish at home. It's, some of them lean more than others. You know, the skinny fish, you can really see the angel fish, boy, they really go over. And the ones that lean over the farthest are the, are the ones that are sensing the light quickly and, and also responding to it in more than the ones that don't. And that's one of the criteria they used to, um, to pick space fish. And then they flew them on the, on the space shuttle. And down at the bottom um, picture is the fish tank that they flew on the space shuttle. Uh, these are fish are called Madaka. And you see the air bubble in the center there. That's, you know, there's no top or bottom to this fish tank, right? So the air doesn't go to the top. The air goes to the middle and makes a bubble. And then you can't sprinkle a fish food on the top of the tank either. You have to put it in little fish food bars, and then the fish come and peck at it to get their food. But they did breed the fish, and, um, and they had offspring in space. And they, they grew up, and they brought them back, and they had offspring. And they found that they do pass this trait along, this adaptation to space trait is passed along. Um, to their offspring, because then they took those fish up on, on a, a vomit comet, and they, they adapted to just as quickly as, the, um, as their parents and grandparents did. And that, that over on the side there, it's not to scale, obviously, but that's one of the Madaka embryos, and I thought it was cute, because it has these big eyes. Okay? Well, there are other effects, of course, um, of being in free fall, being weightless. Uh, this is a picture of Shannon Lucid on the Mir space station, and she holds the um, world record for a woman in space and the American record for um, being in space. She spent you know, six months up in the mirror, and she's exercising on the treadmill. Because when you're in free fall, there's nothing um, pushing on your legs, and so um, you lose some muscle mass, and one way to help slow down the rate of loss is to exercise, and they put big bungee cords over your shoulders, and basically you just have to push against those things. See, I'm losing my place on my cards here. So usually at this point, I have all the kids stand up and put their heads down like this and their hands down like that because they usually, they've been sitting on the floor in the gym and about this time they're starting to wiggle around, you know. So, they, and so if any of you need to stand up, this is all right. And you can, you can do this experiment. And basically, you just put your head down like this and your hands down. And you, you notice that your eyes start feeling kind of squinty and your nose gets a little bit stuffed up. So you, you can try this on your own. And your hands, um, the veins on your hands will kind of fill up get a little puffy, and, um, and they'll get a little darker color. But if you have thin skin like me, you can see it real well. And then I have them stand up, and they feel a little bit dizzy when they first stand up. 
and, and I explained to them that this is because your heart isn't having, when you're bent over like that, it's like being weightless, suddenly your heart isn't having to push uphill. And so the blood rushes to your head, and that's why your face gets kind of flushed and um, it gets puffy. And, and also the, the veins in your hand go down, and up and then stand up and put one hand up and one hand down. And they stand like that for a couple minutes, and then they compare the two hands, and they can see the difference in color between the two hands and also the um, focus of the veins. And um, so I tell them a little bit about some of the effects of being weightless and um, you know, the face getting puffy. And, and of course, all the women are going to love it in space because what happens when the fluid shifts up there, it fills in all your wrinkles, and your waist gets really small, and you know this part gets larger, and um, you know. You just can't beat it. And of course you're weightless. Um, and you also stretch, you get taller. And the, the boys especially like this. One of, the, one of the experiments in the book is for them to measure themselves in the morning. And put a piece of paper on the wall, you know, they just put a little mark there. And then just before they go to bed, they, they mark it again. And they find that they shrunk during the days because gravity was pushing them down. And then overnight they stretch back out see that they're the same height. I said, well, okay, if you want on your birthday when you make that mark on the wall, do it in the morning because you'll be taller. And um, so we all want to go into space. The guys want to go and get taller and women want to get, you know, rid of the, uh, the wrinkles and the weight. So I think there's lots of advantage to being weightless. But what we do need to measure some of these changes. And one of the things I talk about is, um, you know, well, how do you weigh a weightless rat? So we use the pushing force and we all know that that means inertia. But um, for kids, it's just basically they get the just get the idea of it that you can push something to figure out how much mass it has. So I have my cat. Let me have some of his toys, and I have this little baby mouse. And we do this thing, and you see how fast it moves. I said, see, it doesn't take very much energy to move a little mouse. Just like if you were pushing a uh, half empty, you know, almost empty jug of milk across the counter, it wouldn't take much pushing force to do that. But if you took a, a a full jug, it would take more, more force to push it. So then I take the adult rat, and you see that it goes much more slowly with the same amount of pushing force. So they get the basic idea that it moves more slowly. Then I say, OK, we have these two mice that were on the space station. And um, they're exactly the same size. And I just threw some stripes on one of them. They said, OK, they got out. They escaped from their containment thing. And they got into your M&Ms. And you want to know which one ate them. So let's see if they have learned anything. Get the, uh, we get the mouse and we do, you know, like this, and then we get the other one. Of course, they wouldn't hang down in space. They would just stick out, but they would still be attached. And we see this is the guilty mouse. <laughs> all right, so we do all these fun things when we're in free fall. We can do all kinds of experiments with um, oil, water, and and there's all the changes that we have that we measure. We have to get there first. And this is the um, a, a docking thing. This is Hoot Gibson. And later on in the talk, you'll see his wife, um, Ray Sutton. And um, this was when they were docking with the mirror. And I have an experiment in the book for them to make a docking tool and explain it. If you're going 18,000 miles an hour, that's the same as going about five miles in a second. And so most of the kids live within a five mile radius of their school. Right? And I try to pick some point that's five miles away. And I say, OK, go 1,001. You're wherever that place is, like at the mall or whatever it is that's five miles from your school. And that gives them a better sense of, of the distance, because that 18,000 miles an hour doesn't really translate very well. You know? And that's true for, for you know, just about anybody, actually. So, so they're going really fast, and they only have two minutes to make that docking. And they have to line up 12 latches, at least six of those 12 latches. So that's why they have to practice so much on the ground. And then there's a docking tool for them to make, and they can practice it themselves. <coughs> so then we talk a little bit about the space station today. This is what it looks like right now. The STS-101 crew just, just left. And there's um, two, two pieces up, up there. And on my model, the, uh, the one on the bottom is called node, it was called node one. It's also named Unity, and because it joins everything together, which I found very easily today when, when my model broke right at that point, and, and the whole thing fell apart. There was no place, no way to hold it together without that node. It really, it is really unity. I mean, it holds everything together. It's got four hatches going around the outside, and then one at either end. So there's six places where it can connect. And it's the first piece behind this big truss uh, on my model 
and you can't hardly see it because all the pieces are stuck to it. And then, well, the first piece that went up was in November of 98, and it's the piece that's on the top of this picture, and that's um, Zarya, and it's basically a booster with a, with a tunnel down through the center, and it has um, solar panels which provide power for it and also for uh, Unity. You can see the two crew members, one of them's off here to the side, the other one's stepped over there. There's one of them upside down on the arm, but it's white against white, it's kind of hard to see them. And that was the STS-88 crew, which went up in December and attached these two pieces together. And of course, we were all waiting for the third piece. And it's supposed to go up, finally, this July. Well, I'll show you what the inside of, um, that's the inside of Zarya, and um, that's uh, three members of the STS-88 crew. And you can see it's just basically a hallway down through the center. The outside of that module uh, is fuel tanks, which can be refilled. And, um, but that's basically its purpose as a storage facility for fuel. And the next piece that's going up is the one that's behind it. So you see the one with the this little solar panels, shorter solar panels? That's Zarya. And then uh, the one behind it is Vesda. I mean, star in Russian. And that's the bottom, the top of it. That's, uh, it's Z1 is its official name. It's the first piece on the Z axis. But the crew didn't like that name, and so they talked to their, they looked around their house and they said, you know, oh, it's got this thing sticking to it here, and another piece sticking out over there. And they said, it reminded them a lot of one of their children's toys, so they named it Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> now that tower that's on the top is not going to be in the final configuration. It's actually the, uh, they call it the P6 array, these uh, things that it'll mount on the top like that. And then when they get the truss built, then they'll move it over to the side like this. So that's what is sticking up on the top. And that provides power to Destiny, which is the United States lab there in the front. And the piece sticking out this way, it kind of looks like a nose. Um, that's the airlock. The joint airlock can be used either by the Americans or the Russians. Um, it's got adaption for either kind of spacesuit, in other words. And then you see there's an arm sticking out of the top. Now that, that's this arm that's going to eventually be mounted on the truss and it will slide back and forth. But it, it can also let go, as long as it's connected at one end, it has power, it can go end over end. And it will connect to um, Destiny originally. And, and of course the shuttle's going to dock on the front there of Destiny. This way, comes up like that. And then that arm can reach in and take the uh, payloads out and put them on the, on the truss. I, I'm, I'm really not ignoring you, but I think I'm going to wait till the end to have questions. Um, unless I said something incorrect. Well, you want to correct something I said? Uh, no, no. I, was, I was just wondering why you think Zoria is not going to be the right truck. Why do you think it's not used on this mission to raise the organization? Why Zoria was used yeah. to raise it? Well, it's, it, it's, um, its main purpose is to maintain attitude control, and it only has so much fuel in it. It wasn't in anticipated that it would have to do that function for over a year and a half. It was only supposed to last for about a year. And um, so, you know, if they can use the shuttle uh, fuel system, you know, to boost it, then they don't have to use the fuel that's in there. I mean, so that's, that's the reason why they did that. So, um, of course, the, the white things that are sticking out that look like big flags, those are radiators and you have to have radiators um, to get rid of your um, excess heat. And down at the bottom, you see the little black thing, that's the Soyuz, which is the, um, the crew, um, the, the first crew is going to go up as currently scheduled October 30th. And so on Halloween, you know what they're gonna be dressed up as? <laughs> Spacemen, right? Okay, come on. Yes. Anyway, um, it only holds three people, which is why the crew is limited to three people initially, because if there is a problem and they need to to uh, deorbit, um, they would use that for their escape ship. Okay. Um, next. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you a little bit about when the P6 arrays go up this um, this fall. Uh, that's going to be something to watch. If they go up inside the canister, and if I take one of these off, the canister is down at the base here. And this is, it, it, sl it folds up like that, and then these two pieces come across like this. So it goes up, and then it opens out like that. And then the top comes off, and it pulls, and it stretches it out. And um, that's going to really be something to watch. Um, so 
We should all have our TV sets set up to record when they get to orbit and unfurl that, because that's going to be something to see. Okay. And the next picture, I think, is just one from, from the factory. Um, they were, the, the black part is what it's really going to look like. The, the gold is the um, substrate that it's metal on, which is on the back. And maybe some of you know more about this. I guess Seth knows more about this than I do. So you can ask him about solar arrays. Anyway, this is what it's going to look like when it's finished. And I have a model up here that is also the same configuration minus the PMA, which rolled off at a bookstore sighting I did. I never did find it again. But um, you see how big the shuttle is in comparison, because each one of these modules has to fit into the payload bay. Oh, Yoda hitchhiked a ride inside my space shuttle again. I took Yoda with me on the KC-135 flight. And you know what? I got him to float just like that. Just like Luke did with that ball, you know? It's amazing. That's quite a lot of fun for you, if you call. Anyway, um, <laughs> until you get sick. Yeah, yeah. I, all right, well, we can talk about that later. I have an article about, about the uh, difference between what you read in science fiction about being weightless and what, what it's really like uh, in the July-August issue of Analog, if any of you are uh, readers of Analog. And um, these models are about the size of a school bus inside to give you, you know, to talk, if you want to talk to kids about, you know, about how big it is inside. Of course, it's, and it's like a bus that's full of kids because there's not that much extra room, you know, they're, they're going to be crammed full of stuff. Right now, they're pretty empty, but that won't last long. All right. We'll just move on. I don't know how much time I'm supposed to have. I'm the last one, so. Okay, you're stuck with me. All right, all these bigger rays. Um, one of the biggest dangers is that there's space junk up there, and you all know there is. It doesn't matter. It's going up and down in space. No. Um, this is a crater that was made in the space shuttle window during STS-7, and they had to replace the window. And uh, I know this is this is magnified, but but it was it was big enough for the crew to see it visually. They could see that there was a pit in the window, and this was made by a paint fleck. And uh, in my book, I have a little short fiction introduction into that section about impacts. And, and they're pretty surprised to hear that a paper flip could, could do so much damage. And I said, that's because it's going 18,000 miles an hour. And when you're going that fast, um, you can cause a lot of damage. And I say, well, if somebody took a bullet and they just tossed it at you, it wouldn't hurt you. But if they shoot out of a gun, well, it could kill you, right? And so, so I, I have an experiment for them to do to prove this to themselves. But I am. I, um, the teachers don't appreciate me taking real eggs, so I have just a plastic egg. But at home, of course, you're going to use real egg, and then you can have it for breakfast later. But you take the egg and, and you take a you know a nickel and you put a you know a meter stick along the wall and you have them drop it from different heights. And of course, the higher you go, the more energy it has at impact, and they can see for themselves that it, it cracks the uh, cracks the egg once it's in higher. It really helps a lot for those of us who are hands-on learners to actually do the experiment, not just talk about it. Because they'll forget about it instantly, but if they've actually gotten that egg out and done this experiment, they'll remember that for a long time. And they'll, and they'll understand the basic concept long before they learn about force equals mass times acceleration. You know, they'll, they'll have the basic idea that, that speed is a factor and, and that mass is a factor. Okay. Oh, the... Um, the, the stuff that's up there that they have to worry about, um, there's about 8,000 pieces of big junk that the ground tracks, and we'll give them a warning about. They give them about a six-hour warning that, that there's something coming and they need to move out of the way. And they've already had to maneuver the space station out of the path of a few things. And they expect to have to do that about 10 times a year. And it, it's, of course, with these little engines on the back, as the space station is bigger, um, it takes a long time to move the space station. So. Uh, they have to have a lot of notice. And the space station, of course, is moving at 18,000 miles an hour, and it's going to cover the length of Florida in about a minute. So if you ever see one of these movies where they're looking out the window and they see the big rock come and they go, oh my gosh, they would have been dead long before they finished that sentence. I mean, it's just, there's just no way that you would see something and, and still, be, still be alive when it hit. But um, the, the small stuff that's up there, the paint flag type stuff, will be stopped by uh, what they call local bumpers. It's named after an astronomer, and that's a shield. It's like uh, the parent standing in front of the child, and, and somebody throws the ball, and it hits them in the stomach instead of the kid. And that's basically how the shields work. There's a couple of layers, and that stops the, uh, the impact. If something's damaged, it's the outer layer. And then 
they send the robot out there to do inspections regularly to, to look for places where there might be weaknesses. And um, they can replace uh, parts that way. And, uh, and the windows have kick plates on the outside. They can take those off, put new ones on. And if there's going to be a, they're going to pass through a, if there's a comet shower or something like that, meteor shower coming, they have um, aluminum plates to put over the windows. But actually, the windows are the least vulnerable part of the space station. But this is the part that's going into the solar wind. You know, it's not wind wind. I always have to tell the kids, these are not wings. We call them solar wings, but there's no air. And these are solar panels to collect power. And that's a, a common problem. The kids think that these are wings and that it's flying. But it does move in this direction. So the things that are up here, and they're, they're going to have more impacts than, um, than the stuff in the back. So let's see. Um, I think I have a picture of the window next. Do I? I have a, what happened to the window? Isn't there a window picture there? Yeah. I thought I had a window. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's upside down. Right side up. That's good. Um, that's the, there's going to be one big bay window on the space station, and it's called the cupola. Now, the, the um, Zarya and, the, and Svezda both have, well, not, not Zarya. Svezda has a lot of windows. I think it has 12 windows. I'm not sure. 12 or 14. But they have a lot of little portholes. But they are all together. You know, you just look out one little window. This was um, a big one. They said this is really important psychologically for the crew because they, they need to be able to, to look out in, in lots of different directions. And it's also good if they're using the, um, the arm and they can see more places. Um, this thing is 28 inches in diameter, the, the center one is. It costs about, well, the window that's in the um, US lab that looks down at the ground they're going to use for Earth observation, that one costs about $800,000 because they made a special kind of glass in that one. And, um, one of the other um, dangers in space is, of course, um, radiation. And since you're above the atmosphere, you don't have that blanket to protect you. And um, so they have to put UV covers over all the windows. Because if you just stood in front of that window for 30 seconds, you get a horrible sunburn. And that, that actually happened on a mirror. And they're, you know, the sun was shining in the window, and they just kind of pass them through and stop for a second and burned. You know, it's because um, they don't have those UV filters on the uh, mirror windows. They just try to stay out. Not, I mean, it was just an accident. They were paying attention, I guess, when they stopped in front of it. Of course, you never look at the sun even from the ground because you'd be blinded instantly in space. And then one of the other effects of radiation is the, yeah, is the uh, aurora, which is beautiful from the ground, but I want to see this from space. And that's why I'm part of the National Space Society, because I want to go and see that. Because this is a static picture, but can you imagine that thing moving, swaying around, and the moonlight glittering off of the water? Um, with the clouds moving around. I just, I just dream about this all the time. So I know a lot of you do too. <laughs> so let's get us some tourist flights up there so we can see this. Of course, uh, the year 2000 is a, a peak year for the solar cycle, so we expect that the, uh, the crew is going to be seeing a lot of motors up there. Okay, and I, I don't know, I'll talk a little bit about the solar flares. Um, there's a of course, danger from that. Um, in a year's time, they get about 100 times more uh, radiation than they would get if they stayed on the ground. But that's for a year. And, of course, if you get that all at once during the solar flare, that's when, it's, that's when it's really a problem. And if there were a big flare like that, they would have some notice given to them and they would get in the uh, Soyuz and come home. But the mirror was up there you know, for 14 years and they never had, a, never had a flare that was big enough to cause that kind of problem. Yes, we have a flame here, and some of you have seen this before. Um, this is what a flame looks like in space, and I said, you know, well, you know, we talked about being in free fall and being weightless, and one of the effects is that we don't have convection. Hot air does not rise in space. It just it stays there in front of your face when you breathe out. If you could hold yourself completely still and there weren't any fans blowing, you would suffocate because there wouldn't be any air movement. It would just stay there. And so I have the little candle in a jar um, experiment, which Take a birthday candle and stick it to the lid of a little jar. And I want to look at the difference between this flame and that one. And one is the shape. You see this one's kind of, it's pointy at the top because of the 
the hot air is rising and cooling it up. And that one, that's not happening. It's just staying there. But it's also, this one's blue at the bottom and yellow at the top. And that one's blue. And I just was up at Glenn Research. A scientist was studying this effect of why why this is yellow on the ground and blue in space, and it's because of the um, the temperature, the burning, that, um, that the flames are cooler apparently, and they don't produce the soot that you see. What's what's the yellow part of the flame? Is the blue part is chemical um, a state change, you know, from whatever the solid is to the, the gas, whatever, and the the yellow part is the soot that's actually glowing, like if you heated up a metal rod or something, and it would glow. So that's what you're seeing. And they don't produce that much soot in space. But I'm still talking to them about it because I'm not, I'm kind of fuzzy on how that actually works. But one thing that we know is the same in space and on the ground is that you need oxygen in order to have fire. So you're up there living in your fishbowl, and there's only so much air. So everybody knows what's going to happen when you're locked inside the fishbowl. And all the kids, they, they know this, but it's good for them to see it again. You know that it actually goes out, and I remind them on their fire safety day when they talk about covering up um, a flame, um, you know, to put a blanket over it, roll, you know, and smother it. What you're doing is you're depriving it of its oxygen. And if there's a fire in a room, you shut the door. You don't open the door because that feeds it more oxygen. You don't want to give it any more oxygen. And so the computers on the space station would, would sense if there's a fire, and they turn off the oxygen flow. But there's still, of course, some oxygen in that module. And then the crew puts on their oxygen masks. And they have fire extinguishers, and they're not chemicals because they would have to end up breathing that later. So what they use is carbon dioxide in their extinguishers, and they just spray that on it, and then the um, system can get rid of the carbon dioxide. Okay, let's see, I put this on the order. Sorry, I don't, know, I don't remember if I put this other chart in here. Okay, go ahead. What is it? Surprise me. Oh, yeah. Okay, that one. Um, this one I do not go over for the younger kids. They, they really can't understand this because they haven't had the, the um, carbon dioxide cycle, but the older kids, the middle school kids and high school, they've had this. And uh, yeah, you see the sock on the filter there. Well, the basic idea, um, you know, we don't have our, any plants on the space station. Not, we don't have a closed cycle at this point. But we do have a reusable system. Instead of using um, just you know, bio canisters to soak up our carbon dioxide, we have a reusable system. So the air goes in and it goes through the filter first. Of course, fans are pulling the air because it wouldn't move on its own unless you had the fans pulling it. It goes through the heat exchanger, and um, and then it gets rid of its moisture. And those those things I you know those little things you get in your shoe that say do not eat that that's the same stuff they're using. It soaks up the water, and then it goes through. You can follow the arrows around. Goes through the fan. Goes through a cooler and make it colder because it re it reacts better when it's cold and. Then see the O's are the open valves and the X's are the closed valves. And it goes down and um, it hits the zeolite bed. That's basically the cat litter stuff. It's the same. And it also is used for fertilizer. And it soaks up the CO2. And then the, the air minus the CO2 then has to have the moisture put back in because, of course, it's hard on your throat and stuff to, to breathe really dry air. And, um, and then it, it's sent back out into the cabin. In the meantime, and this cycle shifts every three hours, they, they switch it back and forth. And you can see on the other side where it's been closed off, the carbon dioxide, the zeolite bed's being heated, and that releases the carbon dioxide, and it's vented to space. So the uh, space station will be venting carbon dioxide. And um, some people think that we might be able to see that from the ground. It might make a little trail, but I'm not real sure yet. It depends on just how much of it there is. They, they couldn't tell me for sure. So that's something I'm going to watch for to see if it makes a trail or not. Okay, so that's how we get rid of the carbon dioxide that we sprayed to get rid of our, put our fire out, and also from our exhalations. Yes. We also have to get rid of the heat from that fire, and also from our, our bodies. And so, first we have the fan that takes the heat from, from around us, because we'd just be sitting there in a bubble of heat. And, and it puts it through a heat exchanger, and it's kind of like a sandwich setup. And inside, the, um, those coils are, are water, and so the, the cold water soaks up the the heat from the air and then the cool air comes out and then that water continues to go on and it flattens out, the pipes flatten out and they have equipment sitting on it. Um, <laughs> this was the artist's idea of what the equipment would be. Um, lights, uh, let's see, I think we have a plant growing there and a camera, you know, a computer, whatever. And, and it picks up even more heat. So now you have this hot water and 
you can't just roll down the windows to get rid of this heat. You know, you have to give it to something else. So then they transfer it over to the ammonia, and then the ammonia takes it on outside to the radiators, and then the radiators radiate it to space. So, so we're using, we're, we're forcing convection with fans, and then we're using conduction basically to get it out of the space. There's no way to use radiation to get rid of it. And the older students have had these three methods of getting rid of heat. Now, the reason we use ammonia instead of water, just we don't go straight from air to water, is because if you send the water out, you all know what happens when you freeze water, it expands, and it might burst the pipes out there. So the um, ammonia contracts when it freezes, so that's a good property. It also doesn't freeze until it's at minus 107 degrees instead of 32, so it gives you a little bit more margin there. Now, some of the, um, I know Carol here works at the spec, but she knows all about this stuff, so if I say something wrong, you can correct me, but um, some, some of the, the tubes that are running through there do freeze, but it's kind of like a cone um, where, or a soaker hose where some of the water or some of the ammonia is going into some of the tubes and, and at all times. And then if it's one's frozen, it just skips that one and goes on to the next one. So um, that's how it's getting rid of the heat. Okay. Now, if you do have a problem in space, you can't just dial 911. You also can't surf the internet and watch your favorite TV program live. And I, it's um, one thing the kids know pretty well. Most of them have taken a trip where they lost their radio station you know, as they got out of range. I said, you know, if you're going around the Earth 90, every 90 minutes, you're, you're not going to stay in range of any station for more than a couple of minutes. And so they have to use a relay to get their radio signals up and down. And it's just like using the mirror to look around the corner. Um, in this picture, unfortunately, it makes it look like Tetris is in a lower orbit. It's actually in geosynchronous, and it stays, um, you know, in the same spot over the ground. There's two of them that they use, one uh, over the Philippines and one over Africa. And they bounce it off. And sometimes it's not in view, and then, of course, the crew can't call home, but then there's another reason why they might not be able to call home, and I have an experiment for that. And I have not tested to see if I can get a radio station in here or not. I don't know. Usually I find some rope coming. Oh yeah, I found something. Now this is kind of directional because it's an AM radio, but... Alright, so, so they have, they're listening to the radio, and I ask the kids, you know, what blocks radio waves. So we take, um, I think we definitely want to block this one. Um, so we say, well, a plastic bag blocks water and blocks air. You know, we block the radio waves and we put it in there. And of course, it doesn't doesn't do anything. And then we take it and we say, well, you know, how about a cardboard box? It blocks light. Maybe it'll block the radio waves. We put it in there. And we see that it muffles the sound, but it doesn't doesn't block it. Then <laughs> make it stop. And so, we try a piece of aluminum coil, and we know that the, most of the space station models are made out of aluminum. And of course it blocks the radio waves, and you didn't even have to wrap it all the way up. And then the kids, and I, so I tell them that if their brother or sister is playing some station they don't like, they just need to get themselves a piece of aluminum coil. It's a problem. Now, several of them have thanked me for that. I don't know what their brother or sister thinks. <laughs> also, if you're having a lot of feedback with your mic and you're giving a talk somewhere, you can have the I got the aluminum foil. I wanted the junior highs to be really bad. And I was going like this, you know, and it would get burned pretty well. So sometimes they can also, so they can't talk to the ground when the arrays are in the way um, or when the modules are in the way. And I say, you know, the reason that, you know, like, just like you have your antenna on the car, outside the car or in the window, um, uh, is the same reason why they put their antennas out here on the truss. So the antennas are out on the truss, they're outside of the module, and also um, if, if the, the point of view when they're trying to get to uh, one of the satellites is blocked by a module, they can't talk to the ground. And actually, um, they have blockage quite a bit at the time, and as the um, station gets larger, it will be more of a problem. Of course, the crew doesn't really think that's a problem because then they aren't being pestered by the ground. And for the first, uh, until this fall, when Destiny goes up there, um, Mission Control is Moscow, Moscow Mission Control. And um, that's what it looks like. It pretty much looks like ours, I guess you could say, you know, form follows function. And they have their screens there, and you see the Soyuz up there. And the reason that they're in charge of emergencies now is because the two um, main pieces, uh, you know, Zarya and Cesta, are their pieces, and the experts are over there for any troubleshooting, and if they have to do any maneuvering and so on they would send the commands from Moscow. But they can also talk to Moscow when they're directly over the sites, um, you know, straight up and down. 
And that happens, you know, a few hours of every day that when they can do that. And they can talk to the ground by ham radio. So if any of you have ham radios or um, the schools have something set up with that, uh, the kids can talk to to the crews. Most of them are ham radio licensed. Okay, next one is. Now this is the space station mission control. Now there's three mission controls in Houston. There's the old Apollo mission control room, which was also used for the early space shuttle flights, and that's where I worked. And then there's the space shuttle mission control, which is on the other side of the wall from this room. And some of you who came to Houston for the ISDC last year went on that tour and saw these rooms. And this is the space station mission control. And this guy here in the blue shirt, that's Jerry Ross, who um, was one of the spacewalkers on STS-88 who put the station together. And they were doing a simulation of that mission when I was there, and I'm sitting, well, and on the book jacket it says you should look for me, but my father couldn't even find me. Um, I'm in, well, I can't even reach it. I'm over there on that side. But anyway, um, I was just there for the sim. I wasn't actually working there. Say what? 10 till 6? Wrap it up, huh? Okay. Well, let's see. I guess we'll skip a few things. What's my next one? Okay, put it on. Yeah, this is a picture of Ray said and eating, eating lunch. One of the things that kids are most fascinated with is the food. Um, you know, I said it's, we send up a lot of dehydrated food. And um, in the book, there's a um, directions for making a space oven so they can make their space lunch. But there's nothing about making a drink. So I show them you can just you can do this too if your kids want to have a space lunch. Um, just put a couple three tablespoons of your drink mix, you know, in a bag. And what I did was I took a bag and I filled it up with a cup of water and I marked it with a with a black marker and then you can use that for your empty bag and you can mark a whole bunch of these. And um, and then just stick a straw in there in a Ziploc bag. So one of the things that's different is space. Um, on the ground, you see the water's all sticking to the bottom of the bag, and the air's all at the top. It's just like your stomach. Stuff's at the bottom, there's at the top. Well, when you're um, in free fall, as I found out of the uh, oh, comet, all of it mixes together, and you have bubbles in the middle, you have bubbles on the side, but mostly the air in the middle. So you can't burp. And if you do burp, you get the liquid as well as the air. Although one astronaut told me that he could centrifuge himself by spin around. I, I think it's one of those fish stories, you know. <laughs> so the next one. So we do take up our food. That's what it looks like in the oven. And you can just move on to the next one. So because water is, is very expensive to take up. It's heavy. Um, we don't. That's why we take our drinks up uh, unmixed. And, and kids, one of the really bright kids asked me, well, wait a minute, if you're mixing the water with it when you get up there, then you had to take the water up there, so how did that save you anything? And that's because we can reuse the water and recycle it. And also the space shuttle uh, doesn't have solar panels. Some of the kids tend to think that the doors are solar panels and they're not, they're radiators. So that's something you might want to point out to some of the kids. Um, they take hydrogen and oxygen and they use it to make electrical power and the byproduct is water. And so they take, whenever the space shuttle goes up, they always load big bags of water to the space station. Because the space station doesn't use fuel cells, it uses solar power. So they don't have any extra water, so they have to recycle everything. And this is the main recycling unit. And so we have the toilet and, um, you know, you, have, you lift up the lid, that's what gets started and it turns on the vacuum system. We don't use any water to flush the toilet, we use air. So I'll show you the, the next one. Um, turn around. This is Dr. Flush, he just retired from Hamilton Standard, and um, he, he's the inventor of this space toilet. Anyway, um, the, the bag is down in the center and it stays inflated with the air, you know, like if you blow into a paper bag. Of course, you don't want to pop this bag, but um, <laughs> that would stay inflated. And, you, and of course, we know that every, every action is equal opposite reaction, so uh, when you go into the toilet, you would go shoot off like a rocket. So they have these leg bars that we go over. You see the white thing there that goes over your thigh and holds you down, and there's a little place for your feet if you want to hook your feet down. And you can use the urinal separately from the toilet, um, or both at the same time. And when you're finished, then you pull that thing he's got his hand on, hand on, and it moves forward like a trash compactor, and it goes thunk down and makes these pancakes. 
which go into a can at the bottom. And currently we're not recycling the solid waste, um, but JSC is working on plans to use that for plants. Um, so it's only a matter of time. At the, uh, the water goes, the urine goes in, and they, they um, centrifuge it, they take out the bad stuff, they treat it with iodine, and then they make space rings. So, <laughs> now that's the American toilet. The Russian toilet, they separate out the water into hydrogen and oxygen, they put the oxygen back into the cabin, and they vent the hydrogen overboard. So you have your choice. You could either drink your urine or breathe it. <laughs> Nobody leaves the lid up in space. If you don't put the lid down, it's the vacuum keeps going because otherwise things might float back out. So um, they have to put the lid down in space. And of course, that also means you can't sneak into the bathroom quietly at night because as soon as you lift that lid, the jet's going off and everybody's going to know that you're in there. So anyway, all right. Um, after you've been refreshed and you want to go outside, then this is the space, um, I talked a little bit about EVA, but the, um, this backpack is not used to jet around, and, and uh, a lot of the kids think that that's what that's for. And it's, it's, base, it's just your parachute. It's, if something goes wrong, you use it to come back. Now, on the shuttle, you know, if Yoda floated away, if he was floating away, you know, the shuttle could fly over and get him. Oh, he dropped his thing. Anyway, the shuttle would fly over and pick him up. But the space station, you know, we just got these little engines here, and we don't have any quick way to refuel all the time, so we're not going to fly the whole space station over and pick somebody up. So that's why they have these little uh, backpacks. But they use tethers to stay tethered at all times. Yes. And um, of course, the spacesuit has to recycle everything too. In this case, the water gets recycled when you when you sweat, and inside the spacesuit you get hot and you sweat. Then that water is collected and it's sent into the little tubes that are sewn into your long underwear and used for cooling. So your sweat gets turned into cooling, which um, is kind of kind of ironic. And it's really fun out there. Oh, usually I. I take one of the, I have this little earth ball and I, I toss it to somebody. Here, you can hold it. Just squeeze it as tight as you can. Yeah, like that. I'll tell you where to stop. And, and they go out there and they work really hard. Now, it's really hard on your hands because um, you have to press against the pressure. Like if you take a balloon and you, you know, it wants to pop out like this and you have to push against it to make it bend. Otherwise, it wants to pop back out again. And that's happening with your hands. And so the, uh, their hands get really, really tired. So instead of using their hands all the time. They're out there for about six to eight hours is about as long as they can do. So, but they have their friendly robot, R2-D2, or this one's called SSRMS, and it slides along the truss. It takes about 20 minutes from, to go from one end to the other. Who's real slow? Is your hand get tired yet? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's important. All right. And, um, and then this, this piece, I said, can come off and go end over end. And what, what's interesting about this is the end of it. It's not a hand like a like, human hand, although NASA is working on one of those for other applications. Oh, I didn't know that was in there. I guess, oh well, I have a, a in the book, way to make an end effector. This is the robot hand. Of course, we have to have a fancy name for it, so that's why I call it end effector. And it's basically two cylinders, and you can make one of these with a toilet paper tube and a piece of cardboard from a cereal box and three rubber bands. It's a tape, and when you twist it, then you can pick things up. And of course, the real one, that should be the next picture, I guess. I don't know how this got out, or I did that. Uh, the real one is used to steal cables, not rubber bands, and, and every piece of equipment on the space station has a, uh, like a doorknob shape on it, which it wraps around, and th that's called a grapple fixture. All right? So when you're all done with all your fun experiments that you got to do in space, and eating and sleeping and doing your spacewalks and everything, you get to come home. You've been up there about six months, and you'll feel a little bit dizzy because your heart isn't having to push uphill. Your heart has actually shrunk physically shrinks and you lose blood volume too. So, um, so you're, you know, you're gonna feel faint when you come back and if you stand up real fast, you probably pass out. Uh, so you can come back on the space shuttle with <coughs> seven people or you can come back on the Soyuz and this is the Expedition One crew that's going up on October 30th. Uh, the guy getting out is Bill Shepard, he's the commander and standing next to him is Sergei Krikalev, a cosmonaut who's had many, many hours in space and Yuri Gidzianko is the cold guy over here and of course, um, we point out that the Soyuz does not land on a runway. It just parachutes down and has little retro rockets at the very end um, to cushion it. But it can land anywhere in Siberia. And um, sometimes it's pretty cold and the cows are startled. But they track it, of course, and then they send a, a truck out to go get them. And who knows what kind of space station you all might build someday. I'm hoping that the kids will you know, build one of these so I can go up there and be a tourist and see that beautiful view of the aurora and float around and create my space drinks. 
Oh yeah, one of the things I tell them when you when you suck on the straw in space, you know, I mean on the ground, you know, it gets pulled back down into the bag, right? But in space, if you suck on the straw, it makes a ball that keeps coming. So you can end up with a barbell, you know, if the, the water is kind of neat. Anyway, um, I guess I'm kind of out of time, but I'm happy, happy to answer any of your questions. And I also can take orders for my book. I, I sold all the copies I had with me, but um, I'd be happy to autograph one and mail it to you if, if you're interested. And uh, I have another book coming out, which is the last thing there, if you want to put it up. Just, I'm a, I wrote a cyberspace book, homework help on the internet. If you have some kids in the fourth or sixth grade, uh, this is just a, a little handbook. It's only $4 to put next to your computer. And uh, so, okay, I'm, I'm done. And do any of you want to ask questions? or?